what an honor it is for us to have you with us. Uh, for those who know Elijah Cummings, uh, he is just a very special person, uh, and he is deeply respected uh, in the entire Congress, representing Maryland's 7th Congressional District. Uh, he is a tireless fighter, uh, and not only believes in our health care, but in terms of assisting the communities, in his case where he represents West Baltimore, uh, issues like food, like education, like housing. Uh, I was fortunate uh, enough to be up uh, with you, uh, Elijah, when we were uh, at Park West uh, at the Community Health Center for the day there. And is what so impressed me is you talked about what it took for us to fight to get the Affordable Care Act passed. And, and, and it's what I liked as much as anything and why you're so at home here is your challenge to the people, which you said, and you might not remember, now you too have a responsibility. It's to be healthier, to stay healthier, to make sure you get enrolled, to understand the process. You weren't there to pamper folks and gee, oh gosh, this, that. You were there to challenge people. And you reminded all of us that it is our children that go on to see the legacy that we will never see. So what have we as a society, what have we done to make this very real? What have we done to, to serve the people in our, in our community? So you're a very, very special leader. Uh, you've certainly made, I know, uh, us think, and when we sat down with uh, Dan and we were in the Capitol and we were talking about budget alternatives and how we can get this, this massive cliff, this massive funding reduction uh, that health centers are um, uh, facing. I know when we were looking at cost offsets, you talked about, Tom, just the COLA in Social Security, the change, in case you ever forget what, I think I forget what you say, and you said it may not mean much to you or I, fifty, a hundred dollars, but it sure means a lot to the people in my district. And, and you made us all stop and think uh, that that hundred dollars could be, could be indeed brutally important. So, uh, it's just the kind of um, uh, person you are. Uh, let me just say, uh, and I see our dear friend who accompanied you, Mr. Learman, uh, the former staff director for the Senate Appropriations Committee, and I know a dear friend, Elijah, to you, uh, and he's been such a friend of the health center movement all, 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 just forever, that when we said we are facing a tight battle, we need leadership, is what, Gary, we did is we debated very heavily as an organization, do you try and get this in the budget? Or do you not? There, with this poison sometimes in the Congress, well, if the president is for it, I must be against it. I know, doctor, you'll be addressing some of those issues. Yet we have said time and again, this is a program where we've been able to draw the bipartisan uh, support together. And it was Elijah, it was Congressman who said, this issue is far too important. If it's that important, Tom, Dan, Nick, it has got to be in the president's budget. And I will take the lead in putting it in the president's budget. I will talk to the president personally, and I will talk to the people around his staff. That's the gentleman we're dealing with. And he mints no words about it. He further issued a challenge to us. Don't send, don't send me in there empty-handed, guys. And Gary, that gets to the petitions. And uh, I said, we got 40,000. He said, I'll be happy to put that on the desk. It's a good start, but it's nowhere near the finish that, that we wanted to do. And when we talked about getting 150 signatures on a letter in the House and all the key chairmen in the Senate on a letter, again, Mr. Cummings said, guys, I'll do the lifting, but you need to help me. I need your help. And not just in one state, but across the country. So please do what you're best at doing. Get your communities engaged. Let them know what's at stake. You have to explain what this means in local terms. And so I cannot say enough. This is a very special award, um, uh, Congressman, that we are presenting. And Gary, I'd like you to come up in and to present it with me. It's only been done four other times, but it is for exceptional and outstanding national leadership. You deserve it, my friend, in every sense of the word.
Tom, thank you very much. To Chairman Wilts, brother can sing. <laughs> it is certainly my honor to be here, and the first thing I want to do is thank you for the award. In the words of Sam and Dave, <laughs> you didn't have to do it, <laughs> but you did, and I thank you. As you probably know, I've been in some fights here lately, so I always want to make sure my mic is on. <laughs> and don't turn my mic off. It is, I'm going to be very brief, um, but I really, I cannot begin to tell you, Tom, how honored I am to receive this award. Because I am receiving it from an organization that goes out every day and feeds their souls. Most of you could make more money than what you're making. Most of you could have an easier life. Most of you could be in situations where you'd be laid back. But just as the chairman said a moment ago, you're finding yourselves under the microscope. He said every five or 10 years, it's probably every year. And you are the ones that go out there and change the trajectory of so many people's destinies. Tweet that. <laughs> That's what you do. You, you change the trajectory of so many people's destinies. People who have no way to get medical care. Yes, we did the Affordable Care Act, but it was you who were doing the things that we've been trying to do in the Affordable Care Act 50 years ago. You've been doing it, and doing it effectively and efficiently. And so I've come by here to simply say thank you. And truly, it has been my privilege to work with you on behalf of those in need. And I'm very much in tune to those in need because I remind people that I live in the inner, 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 inner bullseye in the inner city of Baltimore. I live in the area where the wire is filmed. And I've lived in the same house for 32 years. So, so, so the people that you talked about, Chairman, I see every day. And there are those in Congress, and I hate to say it, it pains me, and I'm sure your speaker will speak about this, that see so many of my neighbors, so many of my friends, so many of the folk that remain nameless, they see them as collateral damage. You may not like it, but when somebody says that they are not going to accept Medicaid dollars under the Affordable Care Act, turning away billions upon billions of dollars while people go sick. Ladies and gentlemen, there is something wrong with that picture. There's something wrong with that. And I know that I'm talking to the choir. I know I'm talking to the choir. But the fact is, is that not only must we do all the things that the chairman said, but we've got to do something else. We've got to be the witnesses. 
I remember one day I was so depressed. It's easy to get depressed on Capitol Hill these days. <laughs> there's a lady who lives across the street from me, or lived, she died a few months ago. She's 98 years old. And Terry Learman, I went and I, when I get depressed, I would always go and talk to her. And I said, Miss Mabel, things are not going so well in Washington. She said, I know, son. I said, and I get low and I get discouraged. She said, don't be discouraged. She said, first you pray, then you work. And then if you cannot do anything else, be a witness. Be a witness. And I said, what do you mean by that? She said, you have to be the interpreter of the pain. You have to let the people in Washington know the pain you see. And she said, how did you say it one day? I heard you say, turn your pain to your passion to do your purpose. Turn your pain to your passion to do your purpose. I have come by here as much as I, I love receiving the award. I came by here to remind you of how great you are. Ladies and gentlemen, as I close, we, a hundred years ago, none of us were here. And I don't care how much tofu you eat. Amen. How many times y'all run around the track? A hundred years from now, we won't be here. The question is, is what do we do while we're here? And I am convinced, Tom, that what we ought to be about the business of doing is helping everybody live the best life that they can live. That's what we ought to do. That's what is American. And so, and so it is. We got to keep on fighting. Yes, I spoke to the president on behalf of this great organization and the things you do. Yes, I delivered a letter, 150 signatures, and put them in the hands of Valerie Jarrett. Yes, we had meetings with the key people putting together the budget. But now, ladies and gentlemen, as your chairman has said, we have done much, but we got more to do. And the thing that we have, had, oh God, the thing that we have to understand is that there was a time when in America we said that we take care of our own. That was what was normal. When you're in a family and somebody gets sick, you don't just throw them out. You find a way to get them well. That's what a family does. That's what's American. Yeah. But we have come to a point, we have come to a point where we have forgotten what normal is. We've forgotten what normal is. And so I'm going to keep on marching. I'm going to keep on doing everything in my power to support you. But as you go out there and you do the things you do, and when you get the paycheck and it hurts you a little bit because you can't buy everything you want to buy, when you go home and your husband says, why don't you just get a job? And you say, I already got a job. <laughs> or when you're spending those extra hours at work, and somebody said, why are you worrying about those people? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Or when you are facing difficult cases over and over and over again, and you become a bit discouraged. Please remember 
that you may never appear on the front page of the Washington Post. No one may ever say thank you. You probably won't even make the local supermarket tabloid. I'm not talking about the inquiry. But remember this. As I said from the beginning, you change the trajectory of people's destinies. I never met my grandfather. I never met either one of my grandfathers. One of them died when my mother was eight. My father's father died when he was nine. And my father tells a story as I close, and I do. My father tells the story, or told the story. He said, when he was a little boy, his father, who was a preacher, fell sick in the pulpit. And they took him to home down there in South Carolina, in Manning, South Carolina. When they got him home, some doctors came to visit. My father, he's sitting on the steps, and the doctors go in, two white doctors, one old and one young. And my father tells the story that they went in and he could remember as if it were happening today. He heard the young doctor said, we got to get him to a hospital because he's going to die if we don't get him to a hospital. And my father heard the older doctor say, he's only a Negro, use another word, of course. We, we can't worry about him. And my father's father died that night. My father died of a heart attack six, about 10 years ago. And all the way up, Mr. Chairman, until the day he died, he talked about that story. See, it wasn't the deed, it was the memory that lasted, but there was something else. And the reason why I'm telling you this is a lot of times when I say you change the trajectory of people's destinies, what I'm saying to you is that it would have been mighty nice if I had had a chance to know my grandfather. You who have grandchildren, imagine the joy that you would have missed out on if somebody had not treated you properly, or if you did not have insurance, or as they say in my neighborhood, you died on a humble. This thing is bigger than you. It is so much bigger. This is about generations yet unborn. This is about allowing a woman in my neighborhood who had colon cancer to be treated for that colon cancer. It allows that grandfather to get the examinations that he needs to discover that he has a heart attack right around the corner and able to prevent it with the appropriate medical care. It's about the mother who's able to deliver those babies and still stay alive and not die like so many I have known about in my own district. Baby is born, mama die. Ladies and gentlemen, we are better than that. We are, as a country, we are better than that. And to you, and to you, changes of the trajectory of people's destinies. I pray that God will allow you to continue to walk the great path that you're walking, to do the things that you're doing. But you got to understand something. In order for you to do this work, in order for the chairman to do the work he does, for this man to have the passion that he has, for Tom to have the passion that he has, and all these folks to have the passion that they have. 
What that means is that they are feeding their souls. In other words, you may think you're giving up a lot, but let me come by. This is a bulletin I want to deliver to you. Don't tell nobody. I'm just telling you. This is about you being on this earth and you being able to do the things that you believe that God put you on this earth to do. You are feeding your souls. That's what you're doing. That's what's bringing you happiness. It's not, it's not about the paycheck. And you know it's not about the paycheck. Or you'd be gone. It's about happiness. Happiness of seeing that person cured of cancer. Happiness of seeing that little boy get that tooth fixed so that he's not in pain while he's in school. Happiness in seeing that mother deliver those babies. Happiness in just knowing that somebody is better off because you touch them. And so your fingerprints, your fingerprints are on people's past, your fingerprints are on their present, and your fingerprints will be on their future. Oh, y'all, some, y'all, oh, y'all, y'all, I just love you. I, I mean, you're just all awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs>